Hello humans and animals alike, this is Dylas, and this video I'll be doing will be very different from what I normally would do on my channel. See, I'll be doing a new playthrough on my channel, but there's also something that I really need to get out of my chest. Something I teased for a while and felt like I should speak out about it in some manner. So here goes. Do you like Pokemon? I like it. Or, well, I used to. But over time, Pokemon has become an appalling sight. Since the games went 3D, the quality of the games got worse and worse. We've come to a point where the highest grossing media franchise, making more money than Mickey Mouse in a fifth of its lifetime, releases buggy, unfinished games with little innovation or soul, and they still sell like hotcakes and are defended by its community. We certainly live in a dark age within the gaming industry. Thankfully, with a big titan like Pokemon, there are bound to be alternatives and competitors. Now, it would be completely unrealistic to think that any of these games would be a Pokémon killer. Because Pokémon is more than just a series of games. It's a franchise built around community. It's a culture. If you think a single game can dethrone Pokémon, then you're just lying to yourself. Like Game Freak lied about higher quality animations as a reason for removing the ability to transfer Pokemon from other games. NEVER FORGET THAT! <clears throat> anyway, the term Pokemon Killer can set up false expectations, leading new players to believe that a particular game would be Game of the Year worthy, when in reality it's not as great as the term might imply. Developers of those games weren't trying to dethrone Pokemon and instead just wanted to follow their passion, providing a monster-taming game for people to enjoy if they're interested. So yeah, Pokémon is a corporate titan, but it isn't everyone's cup of tea. It was never made with seasoned video game players in mind. As someone who's played several RPGs, Pokémon just hasn't done it for me. The story is bare bones, the gameplay has become boring, and if the true soul of Pokémon really is in the multiplayer, I'm not willing to spend more money and many hundreds of hours grinding for the perfect team to soon find out my strategy didn't work out and just quit competitive altogether. That latter part's already happened before I had to pay to battle online. I just don't like playing Pokémon anymore. I get the itch to play it sometimes, but it might bring back those feelings of pain regarding the state of the franchise. I can't change the way things are with it, so I actually want to try and abandon the franchise. So I look for some alternatives. The monster taming genre has a bigger library than ever before, with special thanks to indie developers. Bigger game studios produce games like Shin Megami Tensei, Dragon Quest Monsters, and Yokai Watch. But for indie games, you got Temtem, Monster Crown, Disc Creatures, the upcoming POW World, although that's more of a survival RPG, and the game I'm going to be talking about and playing for you on this very channel, Monster Sanctuary. Monster Sanctuary opened my eyes as to what a monster taming game can be. Developed by Moirai Games and published by Team 17, the same company behind the Worms series, Monster Sanctuary puts you in the role of a monster keeper, with a spectral familiar as your starter, given to you by your parents, as is the custom of spectral keepers. Your job as a spectral keeper is to keep the sanctuary safe from any threats, with the main plot involving a rise in champion monsters and the suspicious alchemists. The following essay is a minimal spoiler list of why I believe Monster Sanctuary is a better monster taming game than Pokémon, and persuasion to try this game out and ultimately branch out to other monster taming games if you have not been happy with Pokémon. Before I get started, I want to say a few things. First off, 
I was originally going to make an hour plus long video about how I feel about the state of Pokemon, but the more I delved into the topic, the more I became depressed, angry, and overall miserable. So, for a more positive mood, I instead decided to talk about Monster Sanctuary and compare it to Pokemon to get at least most of my points across. I also really wanted to compare Monster Sanctuary to Pokemon throughout my upcoming playthrough, but I didn't want the playthrough to carry this offensive connotation towards Pokemon fans, especially those wanting to branch out. I'm also worried that if I went with this, people might associate the Monster Sanctuary community with people who have strong negative feelings toward Pokemon, which is not really the case. Each individual, even as part of a community, is still an individual. They come from different backgrounds and have different reasons for playing the game. This video essay is a happy medium for me to help ease the pain in my heart about the state of Pokemon, and use Monster Sanctuary as a way to make things more positive. If after this video you don't think Monster Sanctuary is for you, then that's all the more reason to look for other monster taming games to see which one is the best fit for you. One more thing, in my YouTube playthrough, I will make some references to Pokemon, and there may be some implicit jabs at it, but I won't directly treat it with disrespect. With that said, let's get the list started. Number 1. Exploration The big selling point of Monster Sanctuary is that it is a monster-taming Metroidvania. For those who don't know, a Metroidvania is a portmanteau of two game series popular for their non-linear exploration, Metroid and Castlevania. In those games, you can traverse the map however you like and can access any areas so long as you have the proper power-up. This game has this structure too, but instead of power-ups, you have monsters use their specialties to help you. The concept of having your own monsters help you outside of battle was something that was done in Pokemon before Gen 7, thanks to HMs. But the way it was handled was very unintuitive, and it was discontinued in Gen 7 onward in favor of loaned Pokemon or devices. Which I don't know about you, just makes the adventure overall less personal. You can have a team of up to six monsters in your active party, and any additional monsters go into a reserve menu, and you can still call on them any time to use their abilities. The Metroidvania aspect of this game actually works pretty well. It makes every monster seem useful in some way. You can go anywhere to your heart's content so long as you have the right ability. But Dylus, you might ask, if I go anywhere I want, won't I run into higher level monsters? Not necessarily, because this game has level scaling. How level scaling works in Monster Sanctuary is that the level of any monsters you encounter increases the more rooms with monsters you discover. So, essentially, the more you explore, the higher the level of the next new encounter in a new room. It's not perfect, but it gets the job done at giving you a consistent challenge and allowing you to explore without any artificial barriers. There are some places where there is a minimum level, however, so be mindful of that and don't skip too many encounters. You wouldn't want to anyway, because this game can get very challenging, as I'll discuss later. Number 2. Art Style Ever since Pokemon Sword and Shield, it seems like Pokemon just doesn't know if it wants to be anime style or realistic. There are also some points where textures or effects just look bad, with the most egregious examples being Sword and Shield's N64 quality trees amid more cell-shaded berry trees and Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl's chibi character models with horrifically scaled-down Pokémon outside of battle. Pokémon lacks consistency in its art and graphical style, making it easy to break player immersion. Many Pokémon fans would agree that Pokémon would have fared better sticking to the 2D-3D hybrid that Game Freak mastered in Gen 5. There are still these kinds of games on the market, like Octopath Traveler, but let's admit, before X and Y we all wanted 3D Pokémon adventures, and this was the price we had to pay. 
Monster Sanctuary was free to choose its own art style, and it settled on a beautiful pixel art style. Much of the game is consistent in its art style, and it just looks really good. The parallax scrolling of the trees in the mountain path, the bright molten lava caves in the magma chamber, the light shining among the trees in the ancient woods, the crisp-looking mountains of snowy peaks. The characters and monsters are also animated really well, especially for a bunch of pixels. Pixel art gets a bad rap for looking archaic, associating the style with more primitive hardware from the days of yore. But I'd argue that pixel art looks more timeless than the realism most AAA studios tend to strive for. Plus, as a retro gamer, I like seeing video games look more like video games and not like movies. Number 3. Role of the Characters In Pokémon, the game treats you, a kid not even in their teens, for the most part, as the center of the universe. People always give you good stuff, you always thwart the evil team, sometimes by yourself, and you always were destined to meet and capture a god. Meanwhile, many other characters you meet are totally worthless, with gym leaders in the Elite Four being treated the same as regular NPCs, not even getting out of the gym to aid in thwarting any evil team's plan. Monster Sanctuary, on the other hand, has many people aiding in the welfare of the whole sanctuary, because it's their job. Most commerce runs in the Keeper's Stronghold at the center of the sanctuary, where monster keepers can buy equipment, food, and medicine. There's a blacksmith that upgrades equipment, and a tower where keeper duels are typically held. There are also keepers responsible for maintaining a monster army, and you can donate any monsters or eggs you don't need anymore to help for a good cause. I have to bring attention to this one, because in Pokémon, any monsters you don't need are just going to be kept cryogenically frozen in a PC, and any newly hatched eggs might be released into the wild, defenseless, eaten by predators, or unable to survive in an environment not suited for them. I cannot accept that. Oh, but it's just a video game, don't think too hard about it. That doesn't matter! It's a critical flaw in the series world that should be addressed. Finally, I want to state something that is more my opinion. The character you play as is a spectral keeper. A special kind of keeper. As with any kind of keeper, it is your job to keep the sanctuary safe. It might feel special to some that an average Joe becomes a hero for the ages, but I must- I just have gotten tired of that formula repeating in every Pokémon game. I find the scenario in Monster Sanctuary to be more realistic. If, even if the character is still a teenager, it's not implied that, really. It's not necessarily implied that you know nothing about the world of Monster Sanctuary. While in Pokémon, every playthrough is supposed to be your first time, and characters have to explain everything to you. You know, I didn't put the ability to skip dialogue on this list. I ran out of room for that, but... Yeah. Everybody in Monster Sanctuary plays a role in the game's setting, and your destiny is a bit more realistic in the game's context. Number 4. Battle System Pokémon's battle system is... Boring. It's only one-on-one -on -one combat with the occasional two-on-two, -two, and the only thing you need to know to succeed is the type chart. Input a command, watch the action, read the text boxes that don't need to be there, rinse and repeat. If you think one-on-one -on -one battles in Pokémon are good, the game sure doesn't do a good job at making them interesting without a one-off battle gimmick, particularly during the main story. Monster Sanctuary is much different with its battle system. Every battle you have in this game is three on three, except for the very brief period you don't have three monsters at the beginning of the game. For each turn in battle, in order to maximize damage to your enemies, you need to have your first two monsters build up the combo meter by using skills that hit many times. These skills can be either attacks, heals, shields, or buffs. Then you can attack with your third monster to deal as much damage as possible. You also need to manage your mana, so you can't always spam your strongest move with your strongest monster. 
The gameplay system emphasizes teamwork for your monsters. Furthermore, the game strongly encourages you to play the game as optimally as possible. At the end of every non-keeper battle, you are given a rating of 1 to 5 stars, and the higher the rating, the higher the money yield and the chance to get rare loot. 5 stars guarantees you at least one rare item, including valuable crafting materials, strong equipment, and eggs to hatch new monsters. Now, I'm sure some people might not be a fan of this and prefer to take it easy in some battles, but this is just me, and I think it makes every battle seem significant. Something else that's in my opinion and not necessarily on this list, catching wild Pokémon in capsules to immediately make them loyal to you goes against nature and feels like brainwashing and imprisonment. And the world of Pokémon calls that friendship! Ha! Yes, taking eggs from the mother is still kind of immoral, but I just feel better that the monster thinks of me as its mother or caretaker in this sense instead of catching an unwilling monster. I think it's a little difficult to explain or justify, but I just feel better with this. Number 5. Skill Trees A big reason why Pokémon is successful is because of its simplicity, but for the most part, it just stays simple. You don't need to know about abilities, buffs, or debuffs to win in the main story. Seasoned RPG players would likely not keep their interests very long with such a simple campaign, and knowing about the hidden mechanics, which I will touch on later, can make the game effortless to beat. Seriously, I feel like knowing about the hidden mechanics just ruins the single-player experience for me. Anyway, Monster Sanctuary keeps things interesting with skill trees. When leveling up, a monster also gains a skill point that it can expend on one of its skill trees. It can be overwhelming at first, especially for someone who's only played Pokémon in retro RPGs, where skill trees are not really a thing. But it's fun to discover each passive ability and apply them to your battle strategy. Plus, it makes every level up feel rewarding instead of specific level ups. And if you're not happy with how you spent your skill points, you can use a skill resetter to rearrange them anytime you wish. And you can buy as many as you want. This gives you freedom to just play around with your monsters and battle strategy. You can also shift your monsters later in the game to enhance their stats and give them a new passive assigned with how they're shifted. Some skills give buffs during turns. Some have a chance of inflicting debuffs each hit. You can gain HP, shields, buffs, or additional hits after inflicting debuffs. You can raise the stats of specific types of monsters in your party. There are several hundred different skills to know about. It's a lot to keep track of! But the Monster Sanctuary Wiki has you covered if you want to know more about particular monsters and skills. You don't even need a wiki to enjoy the game because... Number 6. The game doesn't try to hide anything. Remember how I said Pokémon doesn't really expect much for you to beat the main game? Well, if you want to get into competitive Pokémon, or stand a chance in some random online battle, there is so much the Pokémon games don't tell you that you really need to know if you don't want to get curb stomped. Effort values, individual values, natures, egg moves, breeding mechanics, it's a requirement to consult Bulbapedia or Cerebi to learn about the hidden mechanics. But you don't need a wiki as much for Monster Sanctuary, because all the mechanics are spelled out for you. Look, Slime Shot Level 2 deals 5 hits equal to 40% of the magic stat and applies poison. Dominance, an aura that allows the party to deal 3% more damage for each debuff to the targeted enemy. Slime Infestation makes it so each slime monster in battle applies armor break on a random enemy when their turn is finished. Everything is spelled out, so everyone has an equal chance without having to rely on an outside source. And if you don't feel like doing meticulous math, 
The health bars give you an estimate of how much damage you deal, HP you heal, or shields you apply. Oh, and there's nothing equivalent to effort values and individual values. Just equipment, skills, and food. This means you don't have to constantly grind the same monsters over and over again to get a max potential monster for your team. And that brings us to... Number 7. Minimal grinding to try new strategies. In Pokémon, trying to find a great strategy can be difficult. If the strategy you devise doesn't work, it's probably back to the drawing board, grind monsters some more, and just play Pokémon Showdown instead. In Monster Sanctuary, if you want to try new monsters for online PvP, just find its egg, hatch it, and it will automatically adjust its level according to your highest level monster. Unrealistic, sure, but it's such a huge help that I can ignore it. I could also imagine the Keeper just racing without the player knowing. Just apply your skill points, give it equipment and food, shift it if you need to, give it a few level badges that you can easily buy, and you're golden. It's so easy to try out different team compositions, and you and your opponent will basically be on the same level. And if something needs to be changed, use a skill resetter. If you need a new monster for the team, encounter it, 5 star an encounter, get the egg. If you don't get it, use monster bells to immediately respawn encounters. If you find a shifted monster, getting, in, getting 5 stars guarantees its shifted egg. Any grinding this game has doesn't take you too long, and in no time you'll be good to go for another round in the online arena. Number 8. Challenge and Fairness It's funny. Pokémon's single-player campaign is so easy, yet getting into competitive is so difficult, as nothing really prepares you for it. In multiplayer battles, each of you has a full team of six, you don't use items like potions, only resorting to held items, and there's no affection mechanic for increased critical hits, hanging on with 1 HP, or dispelling status ailments. Everyone uses any combination of Pokémon they desire, and does not have to limit themselves to a single type. But in the single-player campaign, you ALWAYS have the upper hand. Nobody except the champion in secret bosses ever has a full team of six. Their movesets tend to have little to no synergy with the rest of the team, they rarely ever use items, bag items, or held items, and they don't get any affection boost. Meanwhile, you have all the tools at your disposal. It's totally unfair, and it always feels like I'm breaking the rules with pretty much every single battle just by playing normally. Can we really call some of these people we fight trainers? Meanwhile, in Monster Sanctuary, there are much fairer Keeper duels. In single-player duels, you still are allowed to use items when your opponent never uses items, but the big takeaways here are that your opponents always have a full team of six, and they usually have a team of monsters that work well together. One such Keeper Duel has an opening team that specializes in inflicting as many debuffs as possible and staying defensive while another one focuses on buffing and charging as much as possible to deal big damage while gaining charges from getting hit many times. All these battles feel fair, because both you and your opponents have access to the same tools, except for items, and when you win, it genuinely feels like you're the better keeper. Number 9. Monster Journey in Pokémon, I have very mixed feelings about the Pokédex. While there are indeed some interesting entries that lend to world-building, there are far too many entries that are so ridiculous, it makes me wonder how people are even able to live and be happy with Pokémon. I cannot understand how a snail that has a body temperature twice that of the freaking sun to even be able to live on any planet. If it was said to be some part of some sort of myth or legend, then I'd find it interesting. Instead, stuff like this completely shatters the world building. 
Monster Sanctuary has its own answer to the Pokedex called the Monster Journal. While it doesn't give you a monster's average height and weight, it does tell you their base stats, weakness, resistance, exploring ability, and loot, as well as a bio entry and some history. The big difference between the Pokedex and the Monster Journal is that the latter is a solid mix of biology and mythology. Whether the stories the Monster Journal tells are true or not is left ambiguous, and any bizarre abilities the monsters might have are more justified since they were creatures banished from the Old World, which is the world outside the Sanctuary. It also helps that Monster Sanctuary takes place in a fictional, medieval setting, where magic is more common and prevalent than science. Pokémon being set in a modern setting actually ended up doing more harm than good when it comes to world building because of how it jabs into our sense of familiarity with the world we live in. Magic and science can't mix well and have to be handled sparingly. For example, in Harry Potter, wizards are not allowed to show their magic to the real world outside Hogwarts. And in Final Fantasy VII, magic is brought forth from the so-called memories of the planet, with its spirit energy being condensed into crystals known as materia. Magic can work in a science-filled environment when handled correctly, but Pokémon just isn't able to do that by design. So, overall, the Monster Journal provides better world-building than the Pokedex, primarily due to its use of monsters in a more fantastical setting. And number 10, Price. Pokémon has been declining in quality while increasing in price. Previously, Pokémon games were $40 and had more content than the games we have today. Really, I think the games are only $60 purely because it's a big-name brand published by a AAA company and released on a console and not a pure dedicated handheld, even if said console is a hybrid. It's not fair to pay more for less, but many people still do it anyway and I don't freaking understand. It's like Pokemon and Nintendo's all they ever play, but I'm getting off track. Monster Sanctuary, by comparison, is only $20 and frequently goes on sale. I don't know about you, but I think this game is worth full price. But if you are on a budget, then feel free to wait for a sale. Nintendo games hardly ever go on sale, and Pokémon is no exception. Imagine paying a premium for a subpar experience. But I guess that's the AAA gaming industry for you. And there you have it. Those are my 10 reasons for why Monster Sanctuary is a better monster taming game than Pokémon. I understand there are some things in Monster Sanctuary that might not be your cup of tea. It has platforming, puzzles, difficult battles, and is not that much of a spectacle. But that's more of a reason to search for a monster taming game that is a better fit for you. Now, you may have thought throughout this essay that I hate Pokémon for the sake of hating, but that is not true. Quite the opposite, in fact. I grew up with Pokémon and had played it for about 20 years. I'm very passionate about the franchise, as it was the catalyst of many friendships. It was a magical series for my childhood, but as it stands, Pokémon to me, with its decrease in quality, only stands as a symbol of the dark side of the AAA gaming industry, consumer culture, and capitalism. Pokémon has no reason to improve, because many blind consumers would buy the games anyway due to the power of its branding. And even if it wants to improve, the three-year release cycles for each generation evidently don't give them enough time to innovate or truly fix any of the series' long-standing problems fast enough. There's always a step in the right direction, a step in the right direction, but when will we ever get there? I really wish I could say more, but this video has gone long enough, and plenty of other people on YouTube have talked about this, like Distant Kingdom, the Ludomancer, and plenty of others. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do for the state of the franchise, and I have little hope for the franchise, so thinking about this will only bring me pain, so... 
Since I can't control it, I'm just gonna control what I can, which is being able to experience other monster taming games to fill that hole in my heart. Seriously, if you are unhappy with Pokemon lately, please get out of your comfort zone and give other monster taming games a try. You can find something amazing for you, like Monster Sanctuary. There's also Temtem, Monster Crown, Koromon, Nexomon, Disc Creatures, Digimon, Yokai Watch, Shin Megami Tensei, Nino Kuni, and so much more on the market. None of them would ever reach Pokémon's success, but it's okay as long as all of us are having fun. Now that I finally got all that out of my chest, I could begin recording my playthrough of Monster Sanctuary for all of you who are interested. And I won't diss on Pokémon anymore, because I can finally move on. I said what I wanted to say, I'm finished, I'm free. Don't ask me to play a Pokémon game on my channel. I don't normally say this, but since I want this particular video to reach as many people as possible, please give this a like, leave a comment, and share it on social media. You'll be doing a great deed doing all this. Thank you for listening, and check out my other playthroughs on my channel if you're interested. This is Stylus, signing off. See you next time.